Let's start back with Ivana's journey, um, because you mentioned in your talk just then that you went vegetarian first, so yeah. um, I believe you were about 11 when mm -hmm. you changed. Can you remember what your journey was to vegetarianism back then as a kid? Yeah, it wasn't something I thought a lot about. It was, it, it, I, I think it was just innate. I always, and my mom actually told me recently, which I don't remember, but she was like, yeah, when you were like two or three, you would scream crying when we went down the meat aisle. You didn't want to. So oh. I think it was just always, you know, some, mm. some kids are more sensitive to mm. that. And I always was repulsed by the idea of meat. So um, kind of as soon as, you know, when you're like getting into your, well, I was, I was 11, so it wasn't a teenager or anything, but I just when you're starting to question the world. Mm. And as soon as I realized that you could be vegan, I mean, vegetarian and healthy, um, I, I did. And yeah, that was pretty easy for me. Yeah. And when I did the podcast, I met your beautiful pussycat. And I, I remember, I just remember you saying something in passing that when you were a kid, you had lots and lots of cats. Yes. Um, so you had a parents that enjoyed being with animals and encouraged that oh, compassion. Yeah. yeah, we practically had a farm. <laughs> yeah, but I think it might, well, we lived in the countryside, mm -hmm. like away from children. So I think they, they got us animals as a <laughs> consolation. <laughs> they were like, be friends with animals. Um, yeah, so we had, at one point we had 11 cats. We had a dog, we had a rabbit and a guinea pig, and yeah, they were our friends, really. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, from what you've just said, that journey was some kind of awareness of what was happening to animals. Can you remember when you started waking up to things like factory farming and what you felt about that? Yeah, um, well, I, I definitely, I think before I went vegan, I would have considered myself an ethical vegetarian, which is kind of, you know, not, you're not doing your full homework there. <laughs> But yeah, I, I, I was really, I just didn't want, I, was, I didn't like violence. I didn't want anyone to be killed. I didn't, I didn't believe that we were like superior to animals. I really feel we share the planet and, you know, we're stronger in, in many ways. So I feel like it's our obligation to care for them. Um, so, but I, I was quite ignorant, I suppose, about what, like, I just thought, oh, vegans are being too fussy. Okay, you're not, you know, what, like, I thought it was, I didn't realize that there was any animal, like, slaughter involved in ha just eating a vegetarian diet. Mm. I just didn't think about the fact that, like, oh, yeah, when those dairy cows are done, do they go to retirement mm. homes? You know, you just mm. don't make, mm. you don't ask any questions. Mm. So, um, no, I was aware of, yeah, factory farming. And I thought I was doing everything to, you know, go against it. Um, but yeah, it wasn't until like my late teens when I started hearing about veganism and mm. started to see, oh, they actually make a lot of sense. Yeah. So, so what triggered that transition? Can you remember in going to veganism then? Yeah. Um, well, so so part of like you know being kind of ha having a profile and being in the spotlight, people are always asking you to care about causes. Like every week, you get someone please tweet about this or care about this. And, and at first I just kind of said yes to everything. And eventually I got to a point where I was like, oh, I, there's so much, you could just spend your whole life caring and your heart bleeding for everything. And then, but then I started to notice that when animal charities came to me, it, it felt totally different. I felt like I wasn't just being a mouthpiece. Mm -hmm. I felt like I was speaking about the thing that most mattered to me in the world and, and the thing that most upset me. And I found the words myself. I didn't just have to like repeat verbatim what they said and that's when I was like I think I really care about this I, and, and this is the thing that I feel the world has got the most wrong and um, so yeah so, so then I started speaking out about yeah animal kind of animal rights issues or welfare issues mm -hmm. as I kind of said in my talk like they, they kind of the campaigns that are easy to care about like no fur and mm -hmm. um, you know yeah. no no uh, no cages things like that and then when I would talk about them people would be like well why not vegan And I just didn't really have an answer. I was like, because mm, it's, it's a bit radical, it's a bit awkward. Mm. But like, then I was meeting people who weren't radical and who I really liked, and they're quite sane. <laughs> <laughs> so um, then, yeah, I, I just started reading. And it was that book, 18 Animals, that really mm. made me be like, I read it and I just was oh, crying and just being like, oh, I agree with everything here. Mm. I just haven't, I, feel, I felt like I was vegan at heart in my mm. soul, but just hadn't done all the to be vegan. Yeah. yeah, and I believe you went to one of my talks at the Bristol. I did. Didn't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We went to your you, talk on dairy. Because you yeah. said something really nice in the chickpeas that you still have the um, 
wall chart that you were given and on your eat the rainbow. fridge yeah. in, in LA, wasn't it? Yeah. Five years later. <laughs> yeah, eat the rainbow. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I tell everybody to eat the rainbow. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Good so, chart. So, yeah, mm -hmm. that's right, the chart. So yeah, that book's had a huge influence on a lot of people, mm. hasn't it? I uh, think it was, it's a nice book because it's like narrative driven. I think so many books are really just fact dense and mm. they kind of ignore the human element of like, you kind of get to a point where you're like, oh, I know I should be vegan, but but it's hard, and, and you have all these, th mm. there's things like, like your culture, what you've been brought up with, your cultural identity, that veganism can sometimes really challenge that. Mm. And um, I like that book, because it was, it was just, it was, it was not, it didn't have an agenda. It was just this man saying, oh, he was about to ha his child was about to be born, and he knew <coughs> he kind of should be vegetarian or vegan, but he didn't know why, and he was, he was trying to find out for mm. this person who was, he was bringing into the world, and it was really lovely, I thought. Mm. Yeah, he really explored it, and I, I just, I, I want to see more books like that that mm. are about stories about us, you know, mm. humans. Yeah, I think, I think sometimes, I mean, what you, you touched upon in your talk is sometimes when you change um, for whatever that belief is, and you, you grow in awareness. You become so passionate about it, don't mm. you? That sometimes you can forget what it was like when you were once a meat eater, totally. and yeah. you can forget what it is that would have influenced you. Mm. Um, I mean, I find that when I do the undercover investigations, because anger can come into play because you've just seen yeah. something that's absolutely horrific, and all of you will recognise that from the footage that you've seen. Um, and anger, you can use it, can't you? Can utilise yeah. it to drive yourself forward with determination. But in terms of changing other people. Anger can be very off-putting. Can be alienating. So, yeah. so, so, so you have to sort of like absorb that, um, direct it, yeah. and you have to allow it to come out in other ways, don't you? Totally. In terms of when you're trying to persuade somebody. Yeah. No, but I told, and I get yeah. what you mean, and I, that's why I understand angry militant vegans because I'm like, yeah, yeah every time I watch a do documentary, yeah. I feel that. Yes. And I feel like we yeah. don't have time to be patient, we don't have yeah. time to be compassionate, but yeah. but we but then you get you always come back to. But you have to, because otherwise nobody's listening to yes. this message that is so very important. Yes. And that's why I think I don't. I don't think it's right to rule out animal welfare, like as something that can get people, other people to care. Like some people just don't have a connection to animals, don't think about them, don't care, or maybe they were raised on a farm and it's normal. And it's like sometimes welfare causes are the language we need to to break the ice. That's what I believe. Anyway. Yes, and also more and more the environmental in, um, issues of course are coming to the fore with the terrible destruction of the planet being driven by an animal agriculture. It's the main driver for example of wildlife extinctions. So um, what do you think about in terms of how we change governments and these major institutions who are still supporting what we know is killing our very planet? Mm. Um, do you believe in grassroots activism? Do you think that that should be supported? How do, what do you see the way forward, the future, when we're given just over a decade to stop positive yeah, yeah, feedback yeah. for global warming? Um, I mean, I, I think it comes back to, you know, the most powerful thing you can do is look at yourself and your environment and, and try and have an impact on that. I think it's really important to support um, vegan organisations so they can grow and they can make it normal. I think it, ha it has to become mainstream for, for, that, for that to happen, for the world to change. Cause yeah, not everyone will see the, the world the same way we do. Not everyone will have that passion and that care. So we just need to make it easy. And, and I feel like most people I talk, like, you know, I, sometimes I go around, I go through life in my vegan circles and I think we're making progress. And then recently I did, I did a play in Bath and none of the actors were vegan. And it was a real, like, wake up call mm. to me. It was like, oh, yeah, but, but they were all sensitive, kind people. Mm. And they were all like, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I thought about being vegan. But it's like, mm. but why haven't you? <laughs> but mm. it's like, it's because mm. they're so busy, their lives. You know, a lot of them have children and, and they, there's always so much to do. And they don't really want to go and do a whole lifestyle change. So I think it's on us, the people who care so much and who see it and who've kind of mastered living a vegan life. I think it's on us to make it normal for them mm. and to demand vegan options everywhere we go and to just talk about it and to be a good example, to be, to show that like, you know, you, 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 you're, you're, you're not, you're not to be a total weirdo to be mm. vegan. You can, you can be yourself and, and mm. that's just something about you. Mm. And that's what I love when I meet vegans who it's like, that's not their whole identity. I, I don't think you should, ha you, you don't have to give up everything and, pr and pursue activism full time. I think 
you being in your truth, doing your job, doing the best you can, I think that can be really inspiring to people. So, yeah, I would say, I mean, uh, it's, it's more on you guys to ask those big <laughs> questions of the government, but, but I think the individual, like, yeah, who you can affect and who you can support, where you put your money, I think that's, that's a profound impact, yeah. So tell me in terms of your activism, because um, there are many forms of activism, and one of them, of course, is your podcast, Chick Peeps, which yeah. is really popular. Tell me why you set that up. Um, you've had some amazing guests on there and a huge variety. Yeah, yeah. Um, I set that up because I, I think I found when I went vegan, I was like, oh, yeah, I get it, I get it, I want to do everything. But I was totally overwhelmed because people expected you to know everything at once, like mm -hmm. all the obscure questions, you know, things like, okay, I know we don't wear wool, but I don't know why. And it, it, that, again, I did kind of what I said in my talk, I didn't want it to be a cult. I didn't want to just be blindly following. I wanted it to be my decisions. So I wanted a podcast where we can just ask people all these questions bit by bit. You learn a little bit every week. You don't have to know everything at once. And, and I, I, I was in a very fortunate position of, being interviewed by people like you who have, you know, decades of experience in this field and who've seen the movement change. And I just was like, I want to ask questions and kind of mine that, that wisdom and that knowledge. Um, and, and just, I, I wanted, like, I wanted, I noticed with my friends, like so many of my vegan friends, we just do have debates and talks and it's not antagonistic. It's just curious, mm. like we're exploring our curiosities and finding our way of doing vegan life so um and i and i just found the vibes we had was very upbeat and nice and welcoming and positive and that's not always it's not usually the reputation of vegans have so i was like we just need to show more of this that it can be a warm and welcoming and fun community and yeah. and it certainly succeeded in that if you've not listened to chick peeps if you just google chick peeps Dot com, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, who's your favourite guest? Am I allowed to ask that? <laughs> um, <laughs> guest, plural then. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Choose um, a few. <laughs> few. I'm going to give a few. Yeah. No, I really, I loved interviewing you because uh, no, I like. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm going to say that. Oh, shucks. But, you know, but, but, <laughs> I, we hadn't planned this beforehand. <laughs> no, no, but, but, but I, I, I find, I mean, like you, you are in the field. You are doing the work that like personally I couldn't do because I, I feel like mm. I'd be too sensitive and, and you have somehow managed to do that with your sensitivity and you you know you channel that in the right places and I also find I just like how you're you're compassionate and upbeat you're not despite everything you've seen you manage to be grounded and have patience with people and I just think that's the way to go and um, so I was very inspired by that and I was inspired by Ingrid Newkirk who, mm. who founded PETA mm. because I really and the thing is she doesn't like she's a polarizing figure and she does do some very controversial things but after interviewing her I was like oh it's because she really doesn't care what yeah. other people think of her she's not she's she's trying to grab attention and to put these issues in the spotlight and she, she like I think the reason she has a kind of bad public image is because she doesn't she's too busy helping animals she's too busy thinking of scheming ways to to, to put them in the spotlight to mm. really care about how it comes across and I found that really inspiring. I, I really enjoyed that interview. Yeah yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. and I found I also <laughs> kind of found the root of why she is so provocative is because she's so sensitive. She's really haunted by all the things mm. she sees and and she's a really like she's she's a very kind soul and I think because her activism is so aggressive that doesn't often come across so I like that it's not mm. you know it, it, and it kind of taught me that's not what I would do. That's not my personal style of activism, but it, re it, it reminded me to try and find what is true for me. Mm. So I loved interviewing her, and I loved interviewing the happy pair. They're great. Mm. Yeah, they're these two, if you don't know them, they're so beautiful. They're these two Irish twins, and they're so excited about life, and they're always doing handstands and movement, and they, they, they kind of, they taught me the power of community. They've mm. created this wonderful, like, life around themselves in Greystones in Dublin um, where they use food to connect with people and, uh, that, and, and that's why I think that's why their life is so joyful and fun. I think a lot of vegans, why we struggle is we feel alienated and um, even though you, you know you're doing it for the right mm. reason, it, it doesn't feel good to be left out. So mm. um, yeah, they remind me how important it is to have a strong community. Mm. Yeah.
I've noticed as I've got older, of course, people, um, your colleagues and your friends obviously are getting older with you. Um, and those people that haven't changed in my life or that I've met recently, they talk a lot about the health issues, of course. And um, when you went vegan, I remember you saying that you um, really could feel the health advantages of going vegan, which, mm -hmm. of course, we've got a national health service which is now on its knees. And here we have a solution in terms of reversing major chronic diseases yeah. and yet again we don't have the backing of the institutions the British Medical Association the government as yet do not say mm. hang on a minute here we go you know you don't actually need those drugs to reverse diabetes type 2 for example right. you know doing veganism is such a powerful way of doing it yeah. and I can remember on an individual scale so many teenagers have come to us and said that it clears up their skin for example yeah, same, remember, did, yeah. same for me yeah yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. so in terms of the, so we can bring in people obviously through the health issues, obviously the planet we've mentioned, then there are animals. What is and it that makes I say, you, yeah. Um, just, um, my, my dad is somebody who, he used to be, I just want to give a shout out to my dad. <laughs> um, he's mostly, he's mostly vegan now. And he used to be on a hundred euros worth of medication per month, this blood thinning medication. And uh, when he started eating plant-based, he got off all the medication. Wow. And, but it's just yes. like, nobody was telling that. No, no doctor was telling him that. He went to some like alternative doctor yeah. because his physio told him he was very stiff, his joints. And this lady put him on this um, uh, whole foods diet. And yeah, he got off all the medication. That but it's fantastic. like, it, it does, it makes me angry when I think mm. about that. It's be like, ugh, all these doctors who he's paying are not leading him in the right direction. Mm. They're just... I don't, I don't know, yeah, is it fear or is it, is it because they're afraid to examine their own mm. practices? Mm. I, don't, I don't know, but yeah. it's disappointing. It is very disappointing. And also, more and more, I think it's becoming unforgivable because the science <laughs> is there yeah. to show the power of veganism. So, yeah. so, so there's only so long you can you know, bask in ignorance. Mm. You know, at some point, you have to recognise at least the science, even if they're not doing it themselves. Yeah. But we are, I mean, Viva's part of um, a, a movement which is run now by G GPs and people in the health profession where we've been to several conferences and it is starting to change in the UK. Mm -hmm. But again, as I was um, sort of alluding to with the environment, it's coming from the bottom up, you know, and this is the way things are going to change. It's going to come from us, all of us. It's, an, it's not going to come from government. Well, look at the state of them. <laughs> so, so I was just going to say, before we move on to sort of acting, which I'm sure some of you are dying to hear about, um, why do you support Viva? Oh, I, um, <laughs> well, I think you're really fearless. In, in, I mean, those undercover investigations are... They're so horrible. We so want to ignore them. And I, I think sometimes as vegans we go, well, I'm vegan, I don't need to look at that stuff. But, um, you know, the truth is it's happening now. It's, mm. that, and that's, it's, still, it's still hard to compute that, that that level of suffering and pain is going on all the time, all the time. And so I, I just love that you bring those stories to light and, um, and that you kind of complement that work with showing people another way. Um, and just you, I think mm. you're really. It's really inspiring to have a woman like at the head of this organization, and um, you, you know, you're you're not trying to do this. You're doing this in your own way, and I, I really love that. And you know, it, this is a like, um, like veganism kind of. I think it's like eighty percent females. But we don't often see that in the organizations, like mm. leading the organizations. So. I'm very inspired by you, personally. Oh, yeah. well, thank you very much, and all my team, and I'm inspired by you too, so some, some mutual back patting going on here. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, um, it is really interesting, because I remember you saying to me that you were a shy child yeah. uh, when, you were, you know, when you were young, and that you, uh, the word you used was you were obsessed by Harry Potter. Mm -hmm. And I just thought it was the most amazing, inspiring, uh, wonderful story of this shy child who maybe yeah. feels a little bit different in the world, who loves those books so much, who then goes on to be one of the major stars in it. And I just thought you might tell people today, how did you get the nerve of somebody that was that shy to actually go up and audition because you were living in Ireland and you yeah. had to go over to London, you were still pretty young. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what motivated you to do that and think, yeah, I can do this? Um, I think it would be simply like love or passion, love for, that, for those books and that character. Um, she really helped me get out of my head because I was so, I was so inspired by her that I almost felt quite, I felt, yeah, protective of her. 
I was like, I, I want, I don't want somebody to just take this this character on as a as a role as a step in their career. She means so much to me and to so many people. Um, so I, and, and I was like, I know how to do this character justice. Mm -hmm. I don't know. There was like, just, a, just it was. I mean, it was almost arrogant, but I think it was like <laughs> it was passion um, that I yeah it, it it got me out of my head and. I think yeah, when you when you love something that much, you, you'll it'll it'll drive you to do things that you wouldn't be capable of otherwise. Mm. And um, and I do notice that like now I'm still acting and, and whenever if I audition for a character mm. that I don't really care for or love, I get very nervous because I feel mm. like a bit of a fraud or I, I don't feel mm. that sense of um, being driven to do it. I just yeah going through the motion. So um, that's why I think yeah, it's just very important to follow your passions wherever they lead you. Go all the way down those paths. Yeah. Could that love be, though, some, a character that you actually is really horrible, though? Do you love that character for a different reason? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, I had a character I played in um, a show in London a couple of years ago, and she was like a teenager, and she was not, like, she was just, she, she was, it was, um, that's a very distracting reason. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, she was, um, she was like, not a good person. She was kind of wayward and everything. But I loved her sassiness. I mm. loved how she didn't. She was really confident. She didn't really care what people thought of her. And yeah. was, I don't know. Every character, I think you gain a little. There's something yeah. in them that you're like, oh, I want more of that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And do you, do you actually take from that character? You know, when you. I mean, going back to Luna Lovegood, because it was quite a long period of your and a very um, important period of your life when you're forming who you are as a person. Mm -hmm. Do do you when you're playing somebody for that long and it's that intense? Do you almost become part of it, or do you take part of that character away and she becomes you? Yeah, definitely. For real, I mean, in real life? I definitely, yeah. I do feel like I'm sort of a mix of all the characters I've played, and it's like 50% me, 50% those people. <laughs> I like it, I like it, it changes you. And yeah, with Luna, I think she definitely, um, she made me more like, um, I suppose, spiritual, more aware of, but I think she's a really spiritual person. She, you know, the fact that she doesn't worry, she doesn't get stressed. She's always looking out at the world, being really curious about the world. She gave me that. And she gave me a sense of being okay, feeling like I don't fit in. Mm. Like, you know, I, most, most places, like, most rooms I'm in, I'm just like, oh, I don't belong here. But, but that, you know, when I would play Luna, I, I wouldn't feel bad about that. I wouldn't, mm. I would, I don't know, there's something about her. She just totally accepted herself and, mm. and her idiosyncrasies, her flaws, I suppose, that, you know that 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 was enough, mm. and her self acceptance made her able to be curious about the world and really mm. invest in people. And so, yeah, whenever I go to a place like you know, if it's like a fancy party or, or a talk, <laughs> <laughs> where I just feel like, oh, what am I doing here? I don't, I'm not, I don't belong here. I just kind of breathe into it and be like, mm, neither did Luna. And, yeah. and, and I suppose if you did fit in in every room, you. you You'd be a bit of a bland person. You're just not supposed <laughs> yeah. to fit in in every environment. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. You're supposed to be yourself. And I suppose characters like Luna. I mean, I, I I suspect that quite a few of us in this room, you kind of understand that when when you take on something that at one point was different, like veganism, for example, was once thought of as radical extreme. Of course, today people are aspiring to it. It's the, you know the environment's changing so much, mm. but sometimes you can feel, for want of a better term, a maverick. And one of the beauties of, I thought, the Luna character and the way you played her was, like you said, her self-acceptance. So mm. other people might have had difficulties with their own intolerance, but she continued to tolerate. Yeah. And it was like, with time, because they saw her in a beauty and truth and her, that she was not going to shift, they came to accept her and she became a more and more important character, didn't she? <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, and she gives people that like beautiful permission to be themselves yeah. because they, they just, she's yeah. so authentic and um, she's so, like, that makes her so different to everyone else. That, and I found that whenever I would read the books, and I think this is why I loved her and why I wanted to protect her, I would read the books and I would just feel like a weight off my shoulders, like I didn't have to pretend or, or be, I didn't have to impress her didn't have to do anything to make her like me. She was just, she likes people. She's just curious about what's different about you and what, what does she not know yet. Um, yeah, that, that, that was like a unique quality and I uh, don't know where I was going with this point. Well, I'm sure <laughs> there are some people in this audience who I know are big Harry Potter fans anyway, but and want to know 
and I'm sure you've been asked this many times before, but I'm going to ask it. Do you feel that Luna is um, vegan? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we talked about, about this on the podcast and everything. Who did we say would be most likely to be vegan? There's a few characters we went into. But um, so I do, I kind of think she would. I think it would be yeah. a bit difficult at Hogwarts. Like if you read any of the descriptions of those feasts. Yes. Oh no, I yeah. can't read them as a vegan anymore. <laughs> um, uh, but but I, no, I think I think she's so connected to animals, and they have that quality of like, like that she has of acceptance. They're so odd, uh, you know. They're hairy and they have weird <laughs> colored eyes, and they have wings and everything. Yes. It is so strange. They're so different to us, but there's something we have in common, and they have this stillness and. Um, I love this, I just came across this recently, Eckhart Tolle, he calls animals guardians mm. of being. Mm. He says they make us present because they're not, you know, stressing about the past or worrying about the future. And they, they're so in the moment. And if you yeah. ever, if any of you have like a pet, a cat, like cats, they do demand your presence. They, mm. That you can't mm. just be, if I ever am on my phone <laughs> and stroking my cat, she gets really fed up. <laughs> she just leaves. She's like, you don't deserve me. You're not giving me 100% <laughs> attention. And they do, they do that. And, Mine um, actually takes my mobile phone off me when yeah, I'm on it, yeah. into his mouth and actually chews it and then bumps yeah. his head on me. <laughs> oh, my yeah. cat did something the other day where I was on my phone and she's just sitting there looking at the phone like, like she was judging. I was like, oh, you're right. You're so beautiful. What am I doing? <laughs> and I, 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 so I think Luna, like yeah. she has that relationship with animals yeah. too. She isn't accepted by a lot of her peers, but animals always accept her and they, they're, they're prejudiced against because they're different, because they're a bit too different to everyone else, mm. that we don't understand them, and because we don't understand them, we think we should oppress them. And so she, I think she, she understands that, that they go through. Um, so no, I don't, and I think she's also very sensitive to energies. She's sensitive mm. to like karma. Mm. You know, a lot of people talk mm. about being vegan from a karmic perspective. Mm. They don't want to eat suffering or, or eat those stress hormones that mm. go, that flood the animal system. Um, so, in short, yes, I think she'll be vegan. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> So, I'm sure some of you have got some questions now. So, who's got the mic for the audience? Where's... <coughs> Hello, <laughs> Danny. Um, okay, who's got a question? Ah, <laughs> somebody straight from Hogwarts. <laughs> it's Jojo, isn't it? <laughs> Hi, Jojo. <laughs> So I've got a question for you. Yeah. Um, so if you had, if you could turn any of the Harry Potter characters vegan, who would you choose? <laughs> good one, good one. Oh gosh. Um, probably Harry, because he's, he has a lot of influence. I think. Yeah. Um, you know, being the chosen one and all that, he definitely has a lot of followers. Um, or maybe Dumbledore. I don't. Uh, no, I, now I want to say everyone because I'm like Voldemort because he's so much influence. <laughs> <laughs> he will just do whatever he says. No, no, I don't want Voldemort to be vegan. I think he would be a bad role model for us. <laughs> I think he's, we'd exclude him. No, um, although maybe it would save him. Um, <laughs> oh, who will I say? I can only pick one. I want to pick them all. Oh, you know what? Hermione because she's so passionate and she she really is good at campaigning. You can see that with Spew when she did for the house elves. I think she's vegan at heart as well, and yeah, she's so determined. She has that Gryffindor fire, so Hermione. Who would you pick? Well, I'd probably pick Ronald Weasley. Really? <laughs> Why? Because I just feel like, um, I saw him eat chicken. <laughs> <laughs> I just feel like he's quite a greedy one, so. Yeah, yeah. That's a good, because he's probably the most unlikely one as well. You are? Yeah. <laughs> cool. Such a good question. Thank you. Of course. Another question? In my humble opinion, um, <clears throat> non any sort of non vegan activity, um, and I'll just call it what it is, it, it, currently it's legitimised animal abuse. Mm -hmm. Now, on a happier note, um, I firmly, strongly, truly believe 
that um, at some point in the future, um, things will become the opposite and that um, any sort of non-vegan lifestyle will actually become criminalised. And if anybody wants to live a non-vegan lifestyle, they're going to have to go underground to do that. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I truly believe that. Um, do you believe that's possible? Yeah, I do, I do. Because I, I, I do, I think it's murder. I think that all those things, meat is murder. And it's, it's, I don't think we've any right to, to be exploiting animals or using them for our gain. I don't, I don't, I don't understand where we got the idea that that's our God-given right or whatever you want to say. Um, so yeah, I do. I do think that I think meat will be criminalised. That I, I kind of feel like in our lifetime that could happen. Um, I don't know beyond that though. Um, I don't know. Well, do you, how do you think that will happen? Well, the main thing that's um, fueling my optimism. I don't just believe it. I'm very optimistic about yeah, it cool. happening. Is that um, veganism is now gone from um, you know uh, being marginalised. Mm. Um, no, it's not quite mainstream yet, but it's actually quite quickly getting there. Mm -hmm. So I see it as a progression, and then yeah. that's the ultimate. Um, yeah. As I say, for you know, non for non vegan lifestyles to become you know regarded as criminal activity. Yeah. You know, kind of thing. Um, yeah, and I I also feel like there's a sh there's a shift. People are just becoming so much more conscious. And all the spiritual teachers, actually, Eckhart Tolle, he talks about that a lot. He says that it's inevitable that that people are going to move from dark to light, and I think going vegan is part of it. Um, and I think social media has just so changed the game because that was the real weapon that the animal industry had, that it was secret, it was hidden, and it was hidden long enough to the point where it was just all, we were brainwashed and it was within us. And now I think, you know, kids are being born who, who you can't brainwash them because it's all out there that information is out there it's becoming increasingly difficult for people to continue to bury their head in the sand yeah yeah that. exactly yeah um, yeah yeah so keep I'm very speaking up good share that that's a lovely so that's a lovely <coughs> part to share thank Fine. you martin oh should we just go to this lady here first yeah. there's two here and then martin mm -hmm. um hi Barna. what's your favorite vegan food Oh, <laughs> favorite <laughs> vegan food? Um, I don't know. It's just food. Um, <laughs> I love um, I love chocolate. I love amber. That's like my favorite. Did you say chocolate is your yeah. favorite vegan food? <laughs> 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 Typical <laughs> vegan. <laughs> Upset with chocolate. <laughs> I think we have the best chocolate. Um, and then at the moment, I'm really into that Starbucks mac and cheese. Oh my god, it's a godsend, isn't it? It's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> This lady here, lady in red. <laughs> um, I went vegan last year and I found the first few months I was really angry and really quite depressed for a long time because of with my eyes were suddenly open to everything. Yeah. That's kind of not as extreme these days. But with so many people around me are not vegan, I still get that anger and that sadness. How do you cope with that personally? Um, I think community definitely having friends to vent with and talk about it and and just that that's why I still I'm, I'm an activist I go and I channel it that way but yeah I do I, it's hard to manage I think you have to balance it and I have a therapist I rant to her a lot about it <laughs> you know I think it's important to you have to express these things um, and I would say don't don't you know be, speak your truth I had, I had that um, a, cu a couple of weeks ago, um, just just a, a, a restaurant went out with two friends, not vegan. Well, this, this one girl who I hadn't met, it was like a friend of a friend. And she just did this thing, she ordered this big steak, and then she goes, oh, sorry, it's your mind. And I'm just like, you've ordered it now. It's like, you, you know, on, on the one hand, I was tempted to go, oh, no, no, absolutely fine, because I didn't want to upset, you know, you want everyone to be peaceful. But I knew it was like kind of betraying myself if I said that, and that would really annoy me. I would go home later and be like, I did, I, of course I mind, you know? So I, can't, I just said to her, I was like, well, I wouldn't be vegan if I, if I, if I didn't mind. So, but you know, you, you, I'm not gonna force you to eat something else, it's up to you. And you know, it was, it was awkward for a beat. <laughs> but like, I, hopefully I made, I made her think, and I, I, ma I made her, you know, I think it's kind of, it's a bit insulting when people they, they try and force you to say that you're fine with this. They say, oh, they, they, she, she was trying to get me to say, 
no, 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 it's fine, so that she would be comfortable, even though that would be betraying everything I believed. So I think it's in those moments, without being rude, without shaming them, just saying, no, I don't agree with that. I don't believe that that's right. And that's the way it is. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Is Martin over there? <coughs> I see a great speech at the beginning. I've seen Thanks. a few of your speeches, and it's really nice to have someone who is actually always talking about compassionate approaches and setting a positive example. So I think that's more powerful than people realise. But um, what I've noticed is a lot of the, ma uh, the mainstream is really acknowledging veganism a lot now, and we're seeing increase in supermarkets and other areas. For someone who's in the entertainment industry, which we don't all necessarily have as much access to, mm -hmm. do you notice attitudes changing and people changing and? the way it's perceived in that industry? Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, th and I think something about the arts, like, you know, the people are very sensitive, they're politically aware, they're very active and, and those kind of things. So, yeah, I've noticed on sets, a lot of people will be vegan and they ask for those things. Um, the one thing that they're, they're quite still quite behind on in, in the film industry is using animals in entertainment. Um, that, that, you know, I mean, there have been films like Life of Pi that was really groundbreaking because the tiger was all CGI. But, you know, I, I have friends who are vegans and they'll get a job and it will, you know, there, there'll be a, a, a dog or a cat. And I know people think that's not as bad, but I mean, for example, Harry Potter uses owls. And back then I wasn't vegan and I wasn't thinking about those things, but I have had to think, oh, if I got that job now, what would I do? It would be kind of compromising. Um, so I think that like that that's the work that needs to be done in film now to just not see animals as as our slaves or that they can work or anything um, and to push for that we have we have this incredible um, these skills we have CGI and animals don't need to be harmed and they don't have any business being on film sets really and we, we can do the job just fine ourselves. Have yeah. you found yourself coming into those sorts of conversations on set? <coughs> Um, I haven't yet. Oh, actually, do you know what I did? I did on, on, on Dancing with the Stars um, because there, it, there was country night one of the nights. When, that was the theme. And we, we had team groups. And anyway, we had to have a theme. And without me making any, having any input, they decided there'd be cows in the background and we'd be milking the cows and it would be a dairy. And I was, I was really annoyed about this. <laughs> and I was like, oh, am I seriously going to dance up there in front of the dairy cows uh, on TV? And, um, you know, I talked about, about it a lot. And I tried to fight my corner. I didn't win. But there were other things I did win. I, I did get, you know, all, all my clothes and all the boots and everything. Um, that was all vegan. Just got people talking, but it was just like at least the issue was raised. I didn't win that fight, but um, yeah, and you don't always. And, so, and like you do, you have to work. You can't just not work and be, and be a perfect vegan. Um, but but you you can definitely speak up and make people aware of these things. I think. But yeah, there's long, there's still progress to be made. I was just um, hoping that just before we end, I know there's um, are there any children who want to ask questions? Because I just want to prioritise if there are anybody. <laughs> We've got the 25 year old putting the hand up. <laughs> I'm joking. Yep, yeah, that person, sorry, in blue there. Thank you. Tips, tips for being vegan? Oh, yeah, lots. <laughs> um, I would say read, as, like, yeah, definitely find out, you know. Like, you have to, as I said, as I kind of talked about in my speech, you have to find your reason to be vegan, not other people's reasons. So read as much as you can. And I just find the more you read about those things, the more you're like, yes, I want to do this. It's about will, not can't, you know? Um, and um, I suppose, like, lear learn a few recipes. You kind of do have to get better at cooking <laughs> when you're vegan. I got away with being a vegetarian who didn't like vegetables, but you can't, you can't do it as a vegan, so I have to learn how to cook vegetables properly. But you um, like vegetables now, don't you? I really you? like yeah. them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Your, your taste buds do change, yeah. definitely. Um, so I would say, like, I, I found Delicious Liella really helpful. I loved her recipes and the Happy Pear. They'd be my two go-tos. Um, and listen to my podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Can we thank you very much, Yvonne, for giving it more time for us?